For regular videos on ancient cultures and forgotten civilizations, please subscribe. If you would like to support the channel and become part of our Ancient History fan community, visit patreon.com slash worldofantiquity. Hi, I'm David Miano, and I'm answering voicemails. Now, usually I'll do a whole video just on one voicemail because you know, I might have a lot to say about that particular question. But I've had a, a number of voicemails build up in my list here that don't require as long of an answer. So let's do a bunch today. I'll see how many we can get through, and hopefully you'll like them. Okay, this one's from a fellow named Steve. Hi, here's my question for David. Over the last few years, I've watched a number of videos of lectures and presentations by Graham Hancock, Robert Baval, and other writers with similar kinds of theories about lost civilizations, lost knowledge, and all that kind of stuff. During their presentations, these writers invariably make the claim at some point that their theories are being overlooked, ignored, or even actively suppressed by the academic world. This notion that new or maybe revolutionary ideas are being withheld from the public for some arbitrary reason seems to have a certain allure among an audience that is perhaps unfamiliar to some degree with how scientific research is published. I'll be interested to hear your perspective as an ancient historian on these claims and why they're misleading for viewers that are not well versed in current research practices. Thanks. Okay, and thank you for your question. Uh, good one. Um, yeah, so a lot of people don't know this about academia, but um, having been in it, I can tell you this. Um, young up-and-coming scholars, you know, getting in, involved, get, going for their uh, higher degree and trying to, you know, get into the field, they are strongly encouraged to come up with new ideas, right? Uh, in fact, one of the things they fret about is like, oh, I got to, you know, come up with a dissertation topic and things like that. What could I say that's different? What could I say that's new? You know, and it the trend is that the new generations of scholars always tend to call into question uh, the findings and the consensus often of the uh, previous generation. It happens all the time. Uh, and so we're encouraged to ask questions, to say, hey, do you, do you think you're, they, that they really have that right? You know, you have to come up with new things. If you want to get published, you got to come up with new ideas. You can't just keep saying the same things over and over again. It's not going to fly. So shaking things up is a good thing, as long as the methods are sound. Now, yes, peer review does tend to weed out history and science that's done poorly. But there are always avenues to get your work out there. If not in academic journals, then you certainly could in popular books, on YouTube, on all kinds of platforms. And I would say the public often knows about their ideas, the ideas that appear in the popular books, more than they do the mainstream consensus, the academic scholarly community. Yes, it's true that academics often ignore the work of people like Hancock. Uh, those who are concerned about the dumbing down of society feel that it's best to ignore it sometimes. Maybe it will go away or it's better not to give them a platform. Others like myself engage with it because I don't think ignoring it helps. It's important for people to know why we believe the things that we do. Um, but that being said, I don't think academics are obligated to address every theory that someone happens to come up with. Are people like Hancock truly upset that their views haven't been accepted by the mainstream? I'm not so sure. I think his ideas would lose popularity if they miraculously became mainstream. I mean, how many times have alternative history folks actually tried to get published in peer-reviewed journals? I would guess this doesn't happen very often. Alternative historians get way more attention from the public and make way more money doing it the way that they're doing it. And they can publish theories that are only half-baked if they want. No one's going to say anything. They are not required to dot all their I's and cross all their T's. I mean, come on. You know this. Saying the establishment is trying to silence you is definitely going to get more people interested in what you're saying. That's how clickbait is designed. So the impression that I get is that they are saying these things more to drum up interest than because they truly feel mistreated. It sells. Okay, let's listen to another one. Uh, hello there, Dr. Miano. Uh, name's Marshall, month-long listener, first-time caller. Uh, I often hear um, from people, particularly religious 
um, you know, Christians that, um, that, you know, uh, they use Babylon um, as this classic example of uh, losing virtue and, uh, you know, licentious, debaucherous behavior. And I suppose I'm, I'm, I'm skeptical uh, if it actually was that way. So I'm, I'm wondering, um, I, I've never really learned much about Babylon is the does anything in the history support this uh this sort of biblically inspired belief that uh, Babylon is a den of uh debauchery or was it uh was was the actual uh, historical evidence suggest something uh, quite different I'd be interested to uh know what you uh know what you know on the subject thank you okay and thank you Marshall uh yeah Babylon uh, well the descriptions of Babylon uh in this uh, negative way come from uh, the the Hebrew Bible uh, and the experiences of the Jews. Uh, they had a particular relationship with Babylon that wasn't a good one, uh, not only being uh, subjugated by them for a number of years, but also uh, the, the Babylonians were the ones that destroyed their city of Jerusalem and, even more importantly, their temple. And then uh, the Babylonians under Nebuchadnezzar took a bunch of exiles uh, to Babylon and settled the Jewish people there, uh, and they had lived there for many years. And uh, being among the people of Babylon and seeing their ways, okay, uh, and seeing how their practices were so at odds with uh, the Jews' view of, of what is right and what is wrong, uh, of course they're going to have a very sour taste in their mouth. They're going to not like the Babylonians, okay? Um, so... It's about it's personal experience that's really driving this. As far as what we might call morally, Babylon was pretty much the same as anywhere else in the ancient Near East. They're no worse than the Assyrians or anyone else, right? Um, the religion was polytheistic, just like everybody else's. But the Jews would have been found all of this distasteful. It's, had they experienced the same thing under another power... Uh, their ha- capital and their house of worship being destroyed and they're being taken into exile to this other place, that other country probably would have taken on the same reputation. See? It's just that it happened to be Babylon. Then when Christianity came into being, they borrowed a lot of the imagery uh, concerning Babylon from the Hebrew scriptures and they applied it to uh, other entities and that's how this idea of evil Babylon entered into the Christian tradition too. I hope that answers your question. Okay, let's listen to another one. Hi, David. Hopefully the answer to this question isn't too obvious, such as monuments, proximity to Rome or Greece or wherever it may be. But I've always wondered why, of all the big Bronze Age civilizations, such as Sumeria, Assyria, the Hittites, that Egypt reliably at the forefront of Hollywood's imagination, whereas the others almost never feature. Ah, yes. Why is Egypt so much more popular, you're asking, in, in, especially in movies and things like that? Um, it has captured the popular imagination, hasn't it? I think a lot of it has to do with the things that you mentioned. Um, the surviving monuments are more impressive than, say, for those, uh, those found in Mesopotamia. Not as good, you know. It was closer to Greece and Rome, and European civilization was greatly affected by Greco-Roman thought. Uh, Our knowledge of Mesopotamian history has increased greatly over the last 200 years, but before that, we didn't know much. Whereas with Egypt, um, well, it's had a chance to to grow in the public imagination for a lot longer. It's been the subject of literary works for quite a long time. And then today, you know, ancient alternative history uses Egypt probably more than any other place in their uh, books and videos. Uh, maybe because there's more to look at. So that has something to do with it, maybe. And maybe because also there's a stronger tourist tradition in Egypt. Uh, That could have something to do with it, too. But uh, these are just educated guesses. Okay, let's listen to another one. (coughs) Why are you a dummy? Um, I, I think we're having some technical difficulties here. Uh, uh, just ignore that. How old are dice, and why do they have dots instead of numbers? 
Okay, a uh, question from a possible board gamer here. Dice, well, the immediate forerunner to dice would be uh, knuckle bones, which uh, these are ankle bones of animals that people would throw and use to, to divine things, you know, to get answers uh, in, in the randomness of it. Uh, but the first actual dice, well, there are dice that were found in the Royal Cemetery of Ur. This is around 2600 BCE. Uh, they're pyramidal shaped uh, dice there in the Royal Game of Ur. Uh, so that's, you know, that's not cubical dice. Uh, the first cubical dice, I think, would be from Egypt. Uh, been found in tombs there going back probably to about, oh, maybe 2000 BCE or so. We have what we call the Tuscanian dice. This is from Etruria, the Etruscans. Uh, and I think the earliest goes back to about 900 BCE. This is in Italy. Uh, and some of them have uh, numbers, the, actually the word of the numbers written out on them. Others have the little, uh, the pips, the dots that we were just asking about. Uh, these are made of bone and ivory. Um, cubical dice made their first appearance in China around 600 BCE. The Romans had cubical dice, uh, some with words and some with the little pips. Uh, I don't think there are any with Roman numerals, uh, but it's the Roman traditional dice, the, the ones that they were using with the dots that came into our society, and uh, that's how we got them. I think the, the dots are easier than, of course, it's easier than writing the words. It's also probably better than Roman numerals, too. Uh, and persons of any language can understand it, uh, and no matter what number system you have, you'd understand it if you just had to count the dots. So I think it's just for practical reasons. Okay, let's try this one. Hello, David. I um, recently took a course on the Neo-Assyrian Empire, and something that uh, showed up a lot in the iconography of the Assyrian palaces were these creatures, or these kind of, um, you know, in, uh, inscriptions of um, what has the body of a man and the head of, like, a bird or a griffin or something like that. And I've been researching it. And I can't find much on it. Uh, they were thought to be called Nisroch demons, also referred to as, um, I believe, griffin demons, said it's connected to the Apkalu, which were a, um, a mythical group of monsters in Assyrian um, mythology and stuff like that. And I was just wondering, what do we know about these griffin demons, these Nisroc demons, these bird head human body creatures that are always seem to be holding the bag, the holding the bag that you covered in your other videos. So yes, I'm very curious. I would be happy if you would uh, make a video and discuss it. Thank you very much. And thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, you seem familiar with my video on the um on the bags, and in the first one, the one that's called uh, Mystery of the Sumerian Handbags Solved, um, I have a whole section in there on the uh, these creatures, the Alkalu, and where they come from, what they are, and uh, what they were for, and all that. I'm not sure if you caught that, but I will uh, recommend that video to you. I'll give you a, a link to it uh, below. Um, but I think there's a section, like uh, a good uh, 10 minutes on that, um, where I kind of go over it. So uh, check that out when you get a chance. Okay, here's another one. Hi, David. Have you heard of the rich hat structure in Mauritania possibly being the remnants of Atlantis? I would like to know your thoughts on this, as I personally believe that it could be the case. It remains vastly underexplored and understudied by academics to this day. Oh, uh, yes. Um, this is another one that I've actually done uh, two videos on. Uh, and I think they're the first two videos in my Myths of Ancient History series, uh, if you hadn't checked, uh, checked them out yet. I encourage you to do that. I will also leave links to those below. Uh, but they're called uh, The Lost City of Atlantis and um, the, oh, what is the second one called? Uh, it's about the, the Truth About the Reshot Structure. I think that's what it's called. So uh, check those two out. And I, I kind of cover the entire theory in uh, those two videos. And I hope you like them. All right, let's try another one. Hey, Doc. I'm a student majoring in history. I was hoping for some advice because I I don't feel like I know as much about history as I could or should by now. And I think part of it is because if I don't think about a certain topic or subject after a while, I tend to forget a lot about it, like how exactly the story played out and the effects of it and the exact time of dates. 
And also, I don't feel confident enough in my analysis of historical events. So I was wondering if that's a normal thing for people, you know, like us trying to study it. And also, um, most of my knowledge of history comes from the lectures I've attended and historical YouTubers like yourself and Mr. Beat and occasionally documentaries. And I know going forward, reading is going to be very important, but I'm very much an audio visual learner, so it's very hard for me to get into reading. So I was wondering if you have any advice for people who are into history, but, you know, have a hard time reading. So, yeah, thank you. Oh, thank you for your question. Um, hey, don't feel bad. I, I have had trouble remembering things, too. I remember uh, going through grad school and um, having a hard time remembering things. Uh, it's just so many facts and figures and all these things to remember. It's hard, you know. So that's completely normal. Um, what really helped me in remembering it is teaching. You might say, well, I, well, I got to get through school first. Um, but when you have to say it back to other people and you have to explain it to other people and then you have to, you know, you know, sound like you know what you're talking about, you got to know it, right? But the more times you say it, and you can even do this in practice at home, uh, the more times you say it out loud, explaining it to someone else, that's going to implant it into your mind. It's going to help you remember it better. Now, as far as you being an audiovisual learner more than a book learner, um, keep in mind that the reason why, you know, uh, your teachers might, you know, think, well, you know, the books are important and the videos are not. Uh, you got to go to the books, not the videos. It's not because of the medium. It's not because audiovisual is worse or, or something like that. It's just about whether you're reading scholarly uh, material or whether you're consuming scholarly material or whether you're consuming popular material. And there's a difference between the two, right? So uh, I think they're concerned more about, well, the source citations have to be there. The engagement with other scholars has to be there. You know, the, the kind of presentation it is is different. Uh, there may come a day when, you know, uh, technology or not even technology, where it just gets to the point where academics are going to be like, well, why don't we have a scholarly journal in visual form? You know, they could they could actually do that right now. You know, it's not a bad idea. But anyway, and you can have peer reviewed videos. Why not? You know, now, of course, that doesn't help you right now. But my point is that it's not the fact that books are inherently better. It's just that at, at this point right now, if you want to engage with the scholarship, you have to read the scholarly materials. You got to know them, you know. Uh, but yeah, I mean, what can you do? Um, you could read them out loud, you know. Maybe it'll help implant it into your head better or something like that. But also, practice makes perfect. The more you do it, the better that you're going to get at it. I hope that helps. Okay, let's listen to another one. Hi, David. I am a student of classics here in Glasgow, and I've noticed that there's been a recent debate surrounding whether or not you need to learn classical languages in order to study classics effectively. I wondered what you thought of that. Um, I can see why the ancient languages would be useful in terms of being able to go directly to primary sources. But I also understand that expecting a certain level of Latin or Greek proficiency can end up being quite elitist. I very much enjoy your channel. Thank you very much for your time and take care. Bye bye. Thank you, Anna. Um, from what I understand about the issue, uh, some schools have or are considering not requiring the learning of Greek and Latin uh, for classics majors, and uh, that this is about undergraduate degrees. Uh, for a higher degree, such as a, a master's or a PhD, I think that learning the ancient languages is absolutely essential, right? You, you, you need to know them in order to uh, be able to fully engage with the primary sources, right? But for an undergraduate degree, um, although I think learning the languages is a good idea and it would definitely be helpful, uh, it's definitely better for the level of scholarship uh, a student would be engaging in. Reading the classical documents already translated into their own language would probably suffice. 
So, uh, the short answer is I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing to drop the requirement. Okay, here's another one. Hi, Dr. Miano. My name is Andrea, and my question for you is, what are your hobbies or interests outside of ancient history? Um, I love your videos, and I look forward to hearing your answer. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Andrea. Uh, yeah, what are my hobbies and interests outside of ancient history? Well, um, there's a few things I like to do. Um, I'm a big fan of uh, genealogy. Uh, so I guess that's a form of history when you think about it, but working on my family tree, I mean, you know, uh, tracing my ancestry. Uh, so I've been working on that off and on, and um, that's a lot of fun because it's kind of like doing history, but that history that no one else is doing, because who else is working on your family, right? Your own family. Uh, so, you know, trying to find out my, who my ancestors were and when they lived and where they lived and anything about them. I find uh, very fascinating and fun, so I work on that. I also, um, I like to cook. Um, I'm always cooking. I cook almost every day. Um, I like to try different cuisines um, from different countries around the world, and I, I love to go shopping and get all kinds of unusual ingredients and trying them out and seeing what I could make. So that's a lot of fun, too. Uh, what else do I do? I play chess. I enjoy that. Am I great at it? I'm okay. All right, I'm not great, but I'm okay. Um, and what else? Um, I'm a big Doctor Who fan. Oh, I love that show. Um, yeah, those, those are some of my interests outside of ancient history. Um, so yeah, I'm kind of nerdy. Um, but uh, hey, you know, when, once you're in on ancient history, you might as well go all the way, right? Okay, well anyway, I think that's all we have enough time for today. Those are my voicemails. Uh, we've got more, of course, and I hope you'll uh, continue to uh, watch uh, the series of our questions and answers. Uh, I have other series as well. If you haven't checked them out yet, Myths of Ancient History is one that everyone seems to like. I have travel videos. Check them out. And, of course, if you do love this channel and you want to support it, I could sure use the patrons. So you can go over to patreon.com slash worldofantiquity to uh, help me out over there. And there are, there are some perks uh, for doing that as well. Uh, thank you gifts, I guess you could say, like PBS does. So uh, thank you again for watching, and we'll see you next time. You might like my little e-booklet, Why Ancient History Matters. It's designed to persuade people that the subject is important, even in the modern world. You might also wish to use it to help spread the word. So feel free to share it with someone you know. It's free for anyone who wants it. I've left the link in the description box below the video for you to grab a copy. Catch you later.